Dr. Kamal Bob uh, is with the Constellation Center, but also works with Google. Um, there we go. Signature scarf. Good morning, brother. How you feeling? I'm good, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, and good morning to everyone. Good morning, Lynn. Uh, it's a pleasure. In this COVID world, I just was able to get into this thing backstage about four seconds ago. So <laughs> just so you know, Brian and Lynn are handling things quite well uh, to make things appear seamless and cool, calm and collected. Uh, again, morning to everyone. My name is Kamal Bob. I am the Senior Director of the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing at Georgia Tech, as Brian alluded to. I'm also the Global Lead for uh, Diversity Strategy and Research at Google. And before bringing on our guest, I would just like to, to center us a little bit. I want to follow up, uh, as Lynn said, we're in a, uh, an American state of tumult. Uh, there's no question about it. The, the political violence is raging. The, the racial violence is raging. And some of the core principles about who the country is are all uh, under assault and under question. Uh, I don't think we can just assume that will succeed necessarily. So therefore, there's a lot of work that we have to actually do to ensure that ultimately all of us emerge as a, as a sound, robust, democratic republic. And needless to say, education is central to all of that. I would like to say also that relative specifically to the work that we're doing and part of the premise of this summit is that as we're coming out of this COVID crisis uh, slowly, the educational challenges that we face, I mean, I don't need to say this to you, but let me just say it so that we can be in communion here, are gonna be extraordinary. The, the amount of remediation that's necessary uh, in some school clusters, as you know, half the students have just been gone for the last year. We don't really know what the pedagogical impacts have been of this virtual learning. We're all doing it ad hoc. The, the stress and strain on teachers has been unspeakable. Uh, and then as we build out of that, the accountability measures that we are using are still aligned with what was before the situation. So now we're going to have to try to figure out catch up and remediation. And there's going to be a lot of triage involved in that. So the CS landscape, notwithstanding the profound work that Co and Brian and uh, Dr. Dooley and others have done to get this passage of uh, Senate Bill 108, which is a Herculean success. However, it's still a delicate, it's a delicate educational policy because the principles upon which standard public education are based, accountability measures are math, English language arts, social studies, and we have to make sure that students can read. So as we're doing that and trying to make sure that we get back on track, notwithstanding the popular push for CS education, we all know that in individual schools, the triage mechanisms are gonna come into place. So our work becomes even more important, trying to align what we're doing with the recovery and trying to make sure that our work is equitable. And as you also heard in the news lately, Atlanta is becoming this massive tech hub for the Southeastern United States. Uh, Google is coming, Microsoft is coming, NCR is already here, BlackRock is here, et cetera. All of them need a workforce that has technical competencies. That's where our work comes in. So in framing what our work is about, we have to ensure that all students across the state, irrespective of where they live, downstate, Western on the Alabama border, all the way to Savannah, have access to the ability to participate in this new economy. Otherwise, they're gonna be left out. No question about it. So our work is critical. I think that our ability to convene is essential. We're a communion of each other. And what I want to do in terms of just laying this out is to introduce our dear brother and friend, uh, Junius Williams. He, what he's going to frame for us is, is how we can make some of these things practical. I mean, I think our larger goals are clear. Uh, but Mr. Williams has been a friend to the Constellation Center and to the state of Georgia for a long time. He's a deep thinker in collective impact work and also in the operational processes of making some of these larger goals tactical, specific ways that we can engage in the computing infrastructure to make sure that it comes out equitably, that we have tactical practices that we can follow 
to make sure that our collective work uh, is effective. With that, I want to welcome you to the summit. I want to thank everyone involved for having been here, and I would love to introduce our dear brother and friend, Junius Williams. Okay, I'm bringing Junius on now, and I just wanted to say thank you, Kamal, for your words. Um, we are about 10 uh, minutes early before uh, Junius starts his presentation. Uh, I just want to give participants just a few more minutes to uh, hop into the summit um, before he starts. So, uh, Kamal, if you wouldn't mind um, maybe having just a short conversation with Brian and Junius um, to kind of continue to help set the context and um, give participants just another few minutes to log into the session before uh, Mr. Williams starts. Thank you. Of course, we're in the unusual position of being early. Fancy that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a so, pleasure. Treat. This is a treat. Good morning, Julie. So, Mr. Williams, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Can you hear me okay there? We yes. can. All right. Good and thank morning. you for joining us this early in the morning. First, sure. let's start with just how you're doing, how you're feeling, how you're faring in this strange time. Uh, I'm doing well, all things considered. Uh, I uh, I just want to say a couple things uh, to you, Kamal. Mm -hmm. One is when we met in uh, Philly a couple years ago, your comments still resonate in my mind and have really influenced my my work and my thinking about uh, how you situate the equity work. So I really appreciate that. I also want to say something because I think you hit what I've been saying to people uh, that there's another crisis that we're facing that we're not mentioning and you hit it square on the head. The crisis that we're gonna face coming out of this with our kids, this has been devastating. And on top of everything else that educators face, I'm really concerned that none of us are paying enough attention about the level of remediation and uh, trauma-informed care and stuff our kids are going to need and how we support educators because, boy, it's all dropping into their laps. If you would, I mean, we're, we're in an awkward position of before your presentation, but along those lines, what do you think is, is uh, for students themselves, what do you think is, the, is their challenge in terms of trying to situate the, the circumstances that they're in versus the offerings of school, even their own state of mental strength. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I just wonder what you thought. Well, I just think it is so enormous. I, I'm trying to borrow from some of what I've learned from colleagues who do trauma-informed care uh, to really start by trying to understand what individual kids have experienced because the experience are, are so vastly different that it makes it even more complex, I think, for adults and people who are caretakers for kids to really sort out how that's impacted them. I think just about social relations and how isolated kids have and the whole process of you know being online and isolated for so long, how do you reestablish peer relationships? I also think about, you know, later on when kids are in serious uh, kind of relationships as they're in young adulthood, I just think that um, we need to have a massive influx. I don't know how you are in Georgia, but you can hardly find a counselor uh, in the Oakland schools. And so we're going to need to do a lot around how we engage and support kids and really find out what their stories are and what they need, because uh, all of us know, and just talking to friends, it has affected all of us differently. And what we need to kind of uh, bounce back is different. And I don't think uh, we've ever had such a wide scale need to individualize kind of mental health and instruction for kids. There's, a, there's another dimension of this that since we're talking education generally before your presentation begins, this is kind of a, for all of you watching that are a bit early, this is a, a treat for being early. So those of you who just get here on time and slightly late, sorry. 
Uh, but one of the things that I wondered too, Mr. Williams, is right before the, the clampdown uh, with the pandemic, if we, if we can even remember the before times, in that year, 2015 and 16, in those years, it, it, it never leaves me that some of the major urban educational systems in the country were on strike. Chicago, Oakland, LA, Alameda, Phoenix. There were some in South Carolina. That was before the evisceration of the municipal budgetary structure to support public education. And now with it gutted, I, I mean, I, I have very gloomy thoughts about this, but I wondered if you had some sense of how this might emerge differently. Um, no, I don't. And I'm frightened uh, that we're, we already had such savage inequities in our finance structure uh, of schools. Um, and what worries me, and I know that the president has uh, in the uh, Rescue uh, Act put money in for rehabbing schools, but I, again, I think we're underappreciating the extent. Let me give you a quick story. I'm working with people in West Oakland, one of the most environmentally impacted areas in the whole country, skyrocketing asthma rates and everything. We got money a year or so ago in the neighborhood that's most impacted to retrofit all of the schools in terms of their air filtration systems. Bucket of money, as much as was needed, what we ran into is over half of the schools could not have retrofit. Their systems were so old that they could not be retrofitted. So as we're talking about getting back into schools and you think about urban, suburban schools and when they were built, it's gonna concentrate that we're gonna put kids at risk because we can't immediately retrofit. Now, maybe the technology is gonna catch up really quickly, but they're talking about, you've got to redo the whole HVAC system in the whole school, which is a much larger budget thing. So you add that on and the delays around that and who's going to be impacted, they're going to be kids who are further at risk of returning to regular instruction because we don't have the resources to actually do the retrofit at the extent that some urban schools are going to need it. And that, that really concerns me. So Thinking about the finance structure for schools, um, I think that we're going to have to, to find an equitable system that provides enough resources for the needs that kids have, which are gonna be just, I, I can't imagine it. My own grandkids who I haven't seen in a year, but I notice it when I'm interacting with them that it's very different for them mm -hmm. than it was a year ago. And all parents and grandparents and others mm -hmm witnessing the same thing. I wonder if the, the, as we ramp into your presentation, um, I wonder what you think about the historical moment. Uh, perhaps you, you ramp yourself up here. Uh, if, if we're thinking about this as a confluence of a couple things, I want, I think what you just laid out is very uh, sobering about the, the fiscal structure of our public education system, the funding for it, the mechanisms thereof have, have led to, as you allude to, uh, the savage inequalities, as uh, uh, Brother Kozel mentioned decades ago, which have largely been unchanged. And then we also have now a, a really fraught political environment. But I also think that there's been uh, an awakening. Uh, the I think that the in, in those dark days in the summer, in the post George Floyd, the heat of the American uprising, what I've found hopeful is just looking out across this sea of young people who were just out there, angry, focused, not accepting the way that the structure worked. And I found an enormous amount of hope in that. And I wonder, if that inspired you as well, and then perhaps just take it from there and lead us on. Lead us on. Yeah. It really did inspire me to see the cross section of people who were out expressing uh, their uh, concern about uh, issues of race 
and uh, the criminal system. I don't call it criminal justice because that system ain't never seen no justice. It's a criminal punishment system. And that's something in the long term that we need to deal with. But I was inspired. And what inspired me most was what I've learned, what I've lost over the years which is a sense of urgency and no, this stuff can't wait. I have gotten over the years more passive and acceptance of incrementalism. Incrementalism is not gonna work. We're at the precipice of falling over the cliff on so many issues. And I'm gonna, I know this, some people think this is political, it's not. It's about democracy, the right to vote. Fundamental, we're on the cliff. Do we really believe in that? And I'm just really inspired by young people who are saying, no, we can't wait. We've got to do some things differently. There's not a time span and whether it's climate, whether it's race, whether it's the economy, almost every issue, there's not a long period of time for us to gradually do this. And I think young people need to bring that urgency to get us older folks moving. We don't have an indeterminate amount of time anymore. We've wasted our turning uh, radius. We gotta make a sharp turn uh, on, on these issues. One final point, people my age need to get out of the way because we're obstructing <laughs> the progress. It is startling. Look at the Senate, look at Congress, look at everything in our society we're we're bimodal. People who are running it are 70 plus. People who are living in the experience are 20, 30, 40 years old. We're not going to survive because those young people know stuff I don't know. I didn't have that experience. Sure. I'm adapted to kind of technology, but I didn't grow up like my son had technology almost every moment of his life available to me. So mm -hmm. I just think older folks got to get out of the way and let the urgency uh, and the creativity of young people carry us across the threshold of this more perfect union we keep talking about because we've slowed down and started the other way. We've got to turn around and accelerate the pace if we're going to survive. So this is, um, I love it. I love it. So let me do this. Uh, let me stop there just for a moment and reintroduce you. So for those of you just joining, uh, you you missed out. We had uh, an early uh, morning discussion with our with our dear colleague and friend, uh, Mr. Williams. Junius Williams is uh, uh, going to be our keynote presenter here this morning, and is a longtime friend of the Constellation Center and of the state of Georgia and CS for Georgia, uh, and has uh, expertise in collective impact and the way that it unfolds. But more specifically in how we uh, operationalize the specific aspects of embedding equity into ed educational systems, which is a centerpiece of what we're trying to do with computer science in the state, as we all know. Uh, so what you just walked in on was the tail end of a kind of an early morning treat where we were just having a, a ad hoc discussion with Mr. Williams. And the, the end of that, which some of you may have just heard, was about the hopeful urgency that young people themselves have embedded in us, uh, inspired us, I think, to be considerate of the frailty of the American democracy uh, and the urgency to transform the American educational system. And more specifically, as it relates to us and our community, is how we make sure that the, the tenets of computer science are withheld and are uh, supported as we climb out of this COVID environment and uh, making sure that it is a priority. So with that, I will stop. Mr. Williams, Junius Williams, our brother and our friend, thank you, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And we all look forward to hearing from you. Thank you much, Kamal. I really appreciate that. And it's great to see you again, even virtually. Um, and you may, uh, Brian, need to help me a little as I try to, I'm not real familiar with this platform, but I'm gonna try to go ahead and share my screen and uh, confirm to me that the share is working. Ah, It is. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, and let me start by uh, thanking uh, Brian, Lian, and, and Co for uh, working with me to try to make sure that 
I am as focused on uh, your needs as, as possible. Um, I want to, and as uh, the introduction is indicated and the title indicates, it's beyond uh, access. For the work that I do in equity, it's a similar issue of how do you get beyond an equity lens to really embedding equity in the way that you go about doing the work to uh, achieve equitable outcomes. Uh, what I'm gonna do today, and let me apologize, I had thought for a moment, um, a couple of things. One is I always produce and provide more slides than I can do in the time, but it represents uh, a bit of a toolkit of some of the things so that you have those available. At the last minute last night, I was talking to a colleague and decided to change the order back to the traditional order that I tend to think about these things. Uh, so this is gonna be a little different uh, than um, the, the workshop uh, uh, outline and, and the agenda. And I'll try to guide you uh, through that. Uh, but basically I wanna do two or three things today. I wanna talk about how to establish some ground rules when you're trying to have discussions about race and, and gender. I secondly want to introduce you to four tools that I think are most essential for organizations, collaboratives, uh, anyone who's interested in moving an equity uh, agenda. And then I wanna talk about equity itself, the concept and the process of getting to a point where you can begin to implement strategies to try uh, to create more uh, equitable outcomes. Uh, you'll also note that uh, there are some slides with some resource information. And finally, some supplemental slides. Uh, as Kamal uh, mentioned, much of my work is uh, using uh, the collective impact model uh, for uh, social change. Uh, and so I provided some uh, uh, supplemental slides uh, that would introduce you uh, to that particular uh, model and I would uh, suggest that you at least explore it because it may be especially useful for the work uh, that you're engaged in, in terms of how do you grow the diversity uh, of computer uh, scientists um, uh, in, the, in the field and in various uh, industries. So what I wanna do is I wanna start off and just uh, say a few things about having these really difficult conversations. If you're dealing with equity and you're looking expansively at where people are experiencing uh, disparate or dissimilar outcomes, uh, you're inevitably going to see patterns of concern based on race or ethnicity and based on gender. Uh, and those are difficult conversations uh, to have within our society. And I wanna draw a quick distinction and to talk about some ground rules. The first thing is, and having conversations about uh, equity and especially about race and gender, it's important to distinguish what the level of conversation is. Is this an interpersonal focus around individual behaviors that might uh, be uh, considered biased or racist? or is it more about structural and systemic focus? Uh, and I draw that distinction because in a lot of settings, people need to have that interpersonal level of discussion and understanding about uh, race and uh, gender. Uh, that's not the work that I focus on currently, uh, but I draw that out uh, because um, those interpersonal uh, discussions and focuses on equity are extremely difficult and you need to prepare people. And that's really my point, that regardless of the discussion you're gonna have about interpersonal or personal levels of racism or sexism, or even the structural and systemic focus, those are all difficult conversations that may require different sort of ground rules and it's critical for you to assess in your uh, environment 
where you need to start the conversation. Can you go to a structural and systemic conversation or do you need to create some space for interpersonal? Again, I don't do the interpersonal focus, but one of the things that I've added here is just a link uh, to some resources uh, for folks who want to and need to work on that level. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanna do really quickly is to just share with you some of the things that go through my mind uh, when I'm going to have conversations about gender uh, uh, and, and race. One is as a facilitator, it's my responsibility and whoever's running it to make sure that people are safe and feel safe. There's also a need to direct people's focus on the content and the discussion and not on the personal uh, level. Uh, you have to assume good intent. We are all trying to learn how to better have these conversations and deal with these issues. Uh, you have to acknowledge that a lot of us are operating with massive amounts of misinformation that we've been taught through the culture uh, or uh, through the media, and you have to sift through that. People have to be open to evidence about racism and sexism and the fact that they do uh, exist. Uh, you have to be explicit about especially race and not have coded conversations where you're talking about social class, but you're really talking about race. And you have to recognize that while race is uh, not a scientific construct, but a social construct, it's still has real work and uh, real world impact on people. So those are just some of the things that are going uh, through that go through my mind and when I'm planning to have discussions to try to prepare so that we can get to the substance of the matter. Uh, in your materials package uh, for my session, I've listed some uh, samples of ground rules and some other ground rules and would suggest that you take a look at those. So let me do this. Uh, I switched around. I was going to start with the tools and I was thinking about it last night. And at the last minute, I decided to do my usual uh, order. And what I want to do is to start by talking about the fact that if you're going to have discussions uh, around equity, boy, you have to start with um defining uh, equity and some related terms to get everybody on the same page in order to have these conversations. They are difficult enough uh, in and of themselves. They are um, impossible if people are not grounded in some common definitions so that they can have the conversation. And I wanna share with you some of the sort uh, of terms that you're likely to run into and that you need to be prepared uh, to work with your stakeholders to define. And let me start with the ultimate. You got to define what equity is. I'm still amazed at the number of situations I go into where people are using equity and equality interchangeably. They are different concepts and it's important that as you embark on a journey of equity, that everybody's clear on where you're going. Two sample definitions. Here's one from Policy Link, which is a national advocacy organization. Their definition is more kind of aspirational. Here's a second definition that is more sort of tactical, practical, that comes from my former uh, organization, which really focuses on systematically assessing disparities and opportunities and outcomes and redressing those disparities through targeted actions that achieve structural, systemic, and programmatic changes. So that's my sort of practical, grounded definition of what I'm doing when I'm doing equity work. The point is that your community or your stakeholder group needs to define what they're gonna mean by equity. Um, let me show you graphically because it's such an important concept. Many of you have seen this, uh, uh, graphic. It is a good representation of the concept of equity, which is what do we need to do to give everybody uh, a good opportunity and a fair and just opportunity uh, for any sort of benefit that's available within society. And you can see that the smallest 
of the guys is receiving some scaffolding to put him in a position. Let me show you, though, the better representation of equity and why. Here's the same sort of diagram. This third one is really, this third frame is really what equity is about. It's not only doing temporary things to sort of equalize opportunity or outcomes, it's looking structurally and systemically. And baseball is a classic example. That fence is there. When you're doing these structural analysis, does that fence need to be there? Well, yeah, it probably does. We all understand from uh, baseball, it's where the most exciting play in baseball happens. So we need to have a fence. The issue, does it need to be a solid fence? And you see the solution here when you're really struggling to achieve equity and access and outcomes, you ask about structural barriers and whether they really need to be there in order to accomplish the societal purpose. And this is a classic example of something needed to be there, but it didn't need to be there in a form that excluded the opportunity for some people to participate. That is to me what equity is about. It's provide understanding structural factors that create barriers and figuring out how they can be altered, dismantled, or eliminated. But beyond equity, there are some other concepts that are important. One is the notion of uh, intersectionality. It's this concept that there, the social categorizations that we make of individuals and groups create multiple identities. None of us have a singular identity. I'm a senior age-wise, which is an identity factor. I'm black, I'm male. Those multiple overlapping identities are my intersectionality. They compose my uh, uh, identity. And that becomes a really important because we tend to think about people in singular identities, and in fact, they have multiple uh, identities. The other thing that intersectionality raises is the notion that people may experience advantage or disadvantage, privilege and preference or discrimination and disadvantage around a number of different social categorizations, gender, uh, gender preference, race, ethnicity, class, one's veteran status, one's age, one's religious preference, one's geographical uh, location, urban, suburban, or rural. All of those things we have noted at times have visited advantages or disadvantages within subpopulation. So it's important to understand that when we're on the journey for equity, we're looking as expansively as possible at the dimensions of social classifications that might result in uh, privilege and preference or disadvantage or discrimination. Related to the equity issue is the issue of diversity and belonging. And those need to be defined. They are not all the same. They're often used interchangeably. Diversity is simply a reflection of the fact that we have so many social differences and, and populations and that they should be a source of strength within the society because when people bring different perspectives to problem solving as you well know as computer scientists it's it's the engine for innovation and creativity for people to be able to see situations differently let me spend just a quick moment on what i used to call inclusion and now i call belonging in my own work, greatly influenced by John Paul, which I'll share some other work of his in a moment. It used to be inclusion, this notion of just bringing people in and including them. What Paul has uh, postulated is that that's not sufficient because you're inviting somebody to a table that was created when no representation of those groups existed. And so his notion is to really create belonging, which is the standard, not simply inclusion. You have to not only invite people in, value and welcome them, but you've got to engage them in co-creating the systems and practices and structures so that everybody at the table owns those. So my point again is that there are some key terms beyond diversity in order to have the conversation. I just threw this slide in 
here is the Ford Foundation's definitions for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, grab somebody's definition if they fit, create your own, but have some definitions of key terms uh, as essential to having the conversation. Now, I wanna move on and uh, just, I'm gonna show you a lot of things relatively quickly. These are tools to help you stimulate your thinking and figure out uh, what your work is gonna be. And let me just say it bluntly. My preference, and you'll see in, in a, a few minutes, is for people to engage in something called targeted universalism. Not everybody can get to that standard. So one of the things I wanna share with you is all the different ways or interventions that people are employing to address uh, issues of equity. There is uh, a, There are a lot of people who are into adopting equity as a data lens through which to look at their work and examining where there are disparities, who's experienced successes and so forth. That's an important thing, but it's insufficient. A lot of people are adopting principles and value statements about where they stand on equity. Again, useful in terms of setting the tone within an organization or a collaborative. But as you get deeper into it, employing strategies and adopting strategies that have equity as a central element of those strategies is important. Adopting throughout an organization policies which require people to move toward equity is important. Adopting equity as an outcome for the work along with whatever else uh, might be an outcome of the work. And I'll show you an example of that uh, in, uh, in, in a moment. And then some organizations, few of them, but some have gone all the way in and say, equity is the North Star. It defines everything and gives a context to all of the work that we do within the organization. You've got to figure out at what level and what forms of uh, equity interventions are suitable within your community and among your stakeholders. Really quickly, I want to do, this comes out of the collective impact work, but I want to quickly say this, that if you're working with a group of people, that you've got to situate where you're going to work on equity, what level of kind of organization or collaboration you're going to work on. And these are the four levels in the collective impact construct. The interventions, what you're going to do about the problem, you may well want to figure out and have standards of equity and focus there. You might also, if you've pulled together a collaborative people, you need to think about how does equity apply to the way that we work together collaboratively. You may have a backbone or support organization that's working with everybody to achieve your goals of more diverse uh, 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 co uh, computer science uh, uh, field. Um, you need to think about equity at that level. And then finally, when you're working collaboratively, you've got to worry about, well, how are all of the organizations who are partners working within their organization to support equity? Um, let me just be clear. People get confused at what level they're working on for newly created initiative. It's hard to work at all levels. And my only point is that there are multiple levels and you need to figure out what level is most important for you uh, to focus your attention on because it's unlikely that you can focus uh, on them all. Uh, I'm just gonna skip over this slide, but it's available in the deck that just kind of some critical questions to help you figure out what your focus uh, might be. I wanna move really quickly though in, um, talk about a set of principles. My colleague, Sherry Brady uh, at the Aspen Institute and I have developed this set of some principles that we try to apply in our work um, uh, on equity. And again, this is in the collective impact context. The first thing is that equity has to be a universal collaborative and individual partner organization and commitment. This is heavy lifting, this is tough work. And if people are not committed to doing it at an individual organizational level and at a collaborative level, 
and I'll come back to this, you're not going to achieve what you want to achieve without a collaborative approach. You need industry engaged, you need education, you need community, you need families and young people, you need a collaborative structure in which to get this uh, working of achieving uh, your goal of diversifying uh, the computer science profession. There also has to be accountability. We know that without accountability directed toward um, outcomes in an organization, they don't get accomplished. So it's just a, a plea for people that individual and organizational accountability has to be a part of achieving equitable outcomes. You also have to engage people experiencing disparities and build their trust. You know it as well as I do. There are a lot of conflicts and mistrust among communities who are suffering certain kinds of disadvantages, who have been marginalized, and people in power. And it's not just rounding them up and saying, we're going to do differently. You've got to build trust. Part of building that trust is engaging those folks who have the lived experience in the leadership and planning and implementation to redress the problems. We also need clear language that needs to be asset-based. We need to get comfortable with accommodating differences. We are an extremely, perhaps the most diverse society that's ever occupied the same space on this planet. And we have to develop our muscle memory of how you accommodate respectfully differences between people that doesn't elevate or uh, denigrate any particular group, but recognizing that they have an experience that you need to, um, to accommodate in terms of being effective and dealing with folks. And then finally, this ain't a one-shot deal. It's a continuous process of disaggregating data, learning from the data, questioning policies and practices that are associated with disparate outcomes and continuous improvement. And then let, let me just conclude this segment by, these are some of the practices that we employed at Urban Strategies uh, where I, I worked for a number uh, of years. The first thing, and I've already mentioned this, you've got to define equity and related concepts and educate the community about them. Secondly, and this should hit you right at home, you've got to build data systems to support equity and you've got to effectively use the data that we can generate out of our performance to learn and to continuously improve outcomes for all of the children. You've got to establish equity outcomes and accountability. You've got to engage the community and ensure their leadership. You, and this is an important one. For most of the problems that we face, there are dual outcomes that we need to be trying to achieve. And let, let me spend a moment because this will resonate with you. Grade level reading. It is a dual problem. Our kids don't perform as well as kids in most of the other industrialized nations. So we got a gap with the rest of the world in our kids reading and our kids mathematics. But not only do we have that, but we've got certain kids of color, uh, uh, by gender sometimes, uh, by disability status, who are even more severely disadvantaged, are performing even worse than we are uh, in the aggregate population. That gives rise to the notion that we should have dual outcomes. So in grade level reading, we want our kids reading on par with kids from other industrialized nations uh, around the world. At the same time, we need to close the gap for black and brown and some Asian uh, kids who are reading well below white kids and well below uh, the, the national standards. So that's what I'm saying. It's important to uh, figure out how to increase equity, but also improve outcomes for all. And the method of doing that is targeted universalism. And I'm going to spend some time in a moment uh, introducing you to that. Continual assessment and addressing the equities and then holding uh, systems and individuals accountable. So 
that's a bit of the backdrop for what I want to do next, which is introduce you to four tools um, that I think um, provide part of the solution uh, to how we bring about uh, equity. And I'm going to start off with a tool called targeted universalism. I mentioned John Powell uh, earlier. Uh, he is uh, at the Center for Belonging at Uni uh, University of California, Berkeley, was formerly at the Kerwin Institute at Ohio State University. And targeted universalism is a concept for um, actualizing equity uh, in the work. And here's how uh, Powell defines target universalism. And he argues that fairness cannot be advanced by treating those who are situated differently as if they were the same. And he argues that a targeted universal strategy is one that is inclusive of the needs of both the dominant and the marginal group, but pays particular attention to the situation of the marginal group. Um, and I want to uh, play a video for you uh, quickly, uh, a short video where John Powell himself uh, describes uh, targeted universalism. And bear with me um, as I try to manage the technology uh, to get us over there. I think I need to stop sharing uh, my screen there. Uh, open. Oh, can't do that. Pause with me for a moment. I need to. Uh, yeah, uh, let me. Targeted universalism. Now, let me share my screen. And let me uh, play the video. And Len, Len or uh, someone, just make sure that uh, everybody's seeing it. What is the most effective and sustainable policy response to problems in our society? Universal approaches are widely used in order to package policies for broad appeal. Universal policies such as Social Security and minimum wage provide the same benefits or minimum protections to everyone, regardless of status or group membership. But by treating everyone the same, universal approaches can't root out group-based discrimination and may actually deepen inequality between groups rather than reduce it. And by providing benefits or protections to everyone, resources that could be targeted to groups worse off instead fall to those who are better off. In contrast to universalism, targeted approaches are commonly used. Targeted policies provide benefits or protections based on group membership or status. SNAP, the post-stamp program, conditions and benefits on income level. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires public accessibility for disabled groups. And affirmative action focuses on historically disadvantaged groups. Targeted approaches are vulnerable to the critique that they unfairly favor constituent groups over the public good by directing resources to marginalized groups who are already subjected to unfair stereotypes. But universal and targeted approaches are false choices. There is a third way, targeted universalism. Targeted universalism means setting universal goals that can be achieved through targeted approaches. This approach targets the various needs of each group while reminding us that we are all part of the same social fabric. This can be accomplished by following five steps. First, set a universal goal. For example, 100% proficiency in eighth grade math. Second, measure how the overall population fares relative to the universal goal. In this example, we might discover that only 80% of eighth graders are proficient in eighth grade math. Third, measure the performance of population segments relative to the universal goal. So although 80% of all 8th graders are proficient, we might find that only 70% of Latinx students are proficient. Fourth, 
understand how structures and other factors support or impede groups' progress toward the universal goal. For our Latinx students, classroom instruction materials and lessons designed for English speakers may impede learning, including math proficiency. Finally, implement targeted strategies so that each and every group can achieve the universal goal based upon their needs and circumstances. This may take the form of ESL specific math tutoring for our Latinx students, while another group may require a completely different strategy to achieve the same universal goal. Targeted universalism rejects a blanket universal, which may be indifferent to the reality that different groups are situated differently relative to the institutions and resources of society. By aspiring toward shared universal goals, targeted universalism empowers targeted strategies capable of achieving those goals while moving us beyond concerns over disparities alone and toward our highest aspirations for all. So now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing John Powell. Do you know who he is? Uh, I'm back. Sorry, it took me a moment to uh, end that. Um, so this, I think, is one of the most important tools that uh, people uh, can use to really begin to effectuate some change um, uh, uh, in terms of implementing equity. And this slide just summarizes what was in um, the video, but the kind of five steps in uh, Powell's uh, uh, process of defining the universal goal, and it goes through. Let me give you a quick example that all of us are aware of where this has actually had a massive impact. It's called, and there is a Stanford Social Innovation Review article on this called The Curb Effect. And the, the curb effect uh, relates to what happened uh, through the American with Disabilities Act, where the federal government through that act required municipalities and other governmental entities to ensure that people who were mobility impaired had access. And one of the big manifestations of that was people in wheelchairs or otherwise mobility impaired at every corner, not being able to navigate uh, across into the street and across the street. So the American with Disabilities Act incentivized government to take action to remove those barriers. And we cut out the curbs and made ramps on almost every corner in America or a large proportion. That was targeted for a specific subpopulation, those who were mobility impaired. The universal goal and outcome of that was to make everybody's mobility easier as we adopted a practice in this culture of carrying around too much of our quote stuff on wheels, uh, be it to the airport or to the office with our computer thing. So what was a targeted um, uh, action for a specific subpopulation had a universal benefit. And what Paul is arguing is that we should be conscious about those, that there is almost uh, uh, unavoidably a universal and a targeted goal. So this is an important one. I'm not gonna spend time going through, but in your materials, you'll have an example uh, that Powell uh, of uh, a targeted universalism. Um, and uh, I said, I, I wanna move on because there, uh, there's a second uh, emerging uh, set of tools that are called equity impact analysis. And I'm going to go through this really uh, quickly. You've got a lot of material in the slides. Many of you are familiar with this sort of tool in another context. 
in many states and you are required to do an environmental impact review before you can do a major construction project. And what that requires you to do is to uh, project on what are the likely impacts to the environment, uh, to the economy, uh, to uh, individual people of your uh, proposed project. And once you produce that analysis, you're subject to being asked to make take actions to minimize adverse impacts that you might have on the uh, environment. That methodology has been adopted uh, in a set of tools that are called equity impact analysis tools. And essentially what they ask is that when you're reviewing a decision or thinking prospectively about a decision, that you run an equity impact analysis Um, you have to run a separate uh, impact analysis um, and begin to figure out what you're going to do to mitigate adverse impacts. So there are th at least three sets of these tools that have been developed by uh, organizations. Here's a, a GARE is the Government Alliance on uh, Racial uh, Equity. Kings County is uh, the county surrounding uh, Seattle and obviously uh, the city of Seattle. They all have equity impact analysis tools that they've developed. Here's just a chart that, that kind of compares them. But here's another way of thinking about this, very similar to what we saw uh, in, in Powell's targeted universalism. What's your vision? Bringing to bear some data, understand what's going on. Gathering partners that you wanna work with, the people who are adversely impacted by what's going on or people who are knowledgeable about it. It's coming up with a plan, it's implementing the plan and it's strengthening the plan over time. But this particular tool is focused on the issue of can we, before we make decisions or after we've made decisions and we notice they've had deleterious impacts, go back and analyze whether or not we really needed to do things in that way or are there ways that we can do things that will minimize the impact. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through this on detail, but here's another little case study of Minneapolis. They needed to really reduce cost of uh, operating uh, the district and especially around transportation routes. So they did a bunch of data collection and analysis. And this is applying an equity impact analysis. And what they found in their analysis, and this is really important, is they came up with, with an equity lens and using an equity impact analysis sort of tool, they came up with three different um, options for how they could attack this problem. And what you see here is, what the money is, how much would be saved, but who's impacted. And they looked at how students of color versus white students would be impacted. And what you see in this analysis is Plan C saved more money and had less of a adverse or disruptive impact on students of color. This is the kind of tool and the kind of process that we're really uh, counseling and advising people that you need to take is, using this impact analysis tool before you make decisions, but also after you make decisions to find out which is the most equitable uh, route that one can uh, take where you're both accomplishing your overall uh, uh, outcome or goal, but also minimizing deleterious effects uh, on kids of color. The next tool really quickly is process mapping tool. And this is quite simply a, a tool where you're developing some sort of visual description of what's happening in a decision-making process that is producing an outcome that you can go back and start aligning the data uh, with the impact to figure out where things may, uh, where disparities may be uh, creeping in. There is a, a link at the bottom. Lucid Chart actually has some tools for doing this sort of process mapping. Here's an example that when I first used this work years and years ago, process mapping tool. Um, 
um, on student discipline. And essentially what we did here, and really quickly, is that somebody witnesses misbehavior and we started asking what happens at that stage? We don't know how much misbehavior is occurring. We don't know that. What we know is when there's intervention or witnessing, staff members could ignore it, they could address and resolve it, or they could refer someone to the office. What we started doing is saying, okay, at that decision-making juncture, what do the numbers look like for different populations? So by race and ethnicity, by gender, by special ed status, by income status as measured by free and reduced per, uh, a price lunch, are kids of different characteristics being sent to the office at different rates? Is that where the disparity is entering in? And then we went to the referral stage in the office and we started analyzing the data too. What happened in the office? Who got ignored? Who got sent back to the referring adult? Who uh, got the principal or administrator to address it? You get the picture. We're aligning the data with the decision-making process or the flow uh, of uh, the process to figure out where disparities uh, are entering the, the process. Very quickly related to the challenge that you face, as I understand it, is that you've got multiple processes that are, are need to go on. First of all, you've got a teacher pipeline issue that it's unlikely that you've got enough certified computer science teachers to meet the demands that are going to be produced by the legislation that y'all were successful in getting passed. So what does that pipeline, that teacher pipeline look like? And again, it's a process map. So they're recruiting folks to college. There's financial aid decisions. There's how many students get enrolled in uh, computer science degree courses. There's a uh, teacher preparation enrollment, because you can't just have a computer science degree, you also need to have that. Uh, uh, what is happening in terms of uh, student teaching assignments in computer science? Where are their internships? It's, a, it's laying out the process, teacher pipeline, the same thing could happen with the student pipeline. We know enough about what the predictors are of kids' success to be able to lay out a pipeline. We know that quality early childhood education has a profound impact on kids' later life. Third grade reading, their exposure to STEM-related careers, how they do eighth grade math and whether they get algebra. Again, that's a student pipeline. And y'all know it much better than I. This is just me brainstorming, not being fully uh, informed. But what you're doing is you're laying out these pipelines and processes and then you're beginning to array your data to understand where disparities are creeping in and to strategize on how you might intervene to minimize disparate impacts in, in the process. So again, I think you're gonna be doing a lot of this work. What does our teacher pipeline look like? What does the student pipeline look like? What does the career pipeline uh, uh, look like? Uh, for those who are in industry and those who are in career technical ed and trying to get people through that last stage of getting employment. And then here's one, just as I was playing around and thinking about it that I threw in, there's also a conversion track for y'all because in the short term, you're probably gonna need to be converting some existing uh, certified teachers uh, or maybe it's a partnership between certified teachers who are learning and trying to get their credential to do CS with people from the industry who aren't credentialed at all, but know the computer science. Maybe there's some partnerships. Again, I just threw these in because as I was thinking through it, uh, they occurred to me and I thought I would share to you. But the important thing is how do you lay out a process and array your data aligned with that process to know where disparities are coming in and to measure progress over time. And then the final thing I wanna mention really quickly and ending is all of us are embedded in, or many of us are embedded in organizations. You can't do equity work without figuring out how you make your organization more equitable and there are a bunch of equity uh, uh, assessment tools. Um, 
And I really strongly recommend that as a foundation for doing the work, organizations do an equity assessment or audit, uh, looking at workforce demographics, hiring, retention, and promotion, looking at your contracting practices, looking at organizational commitment, your leadership composition and management, looking at community access and having data metrics that tell you what's happening around equity issues in your organization. Pause a quick minute. There is a bibliography in your materials that lists a bunch of assessment tools. Uh, there are uh, samples of equity impact analysis and other things in your toolbox. And I know I'm running out of time, but this is an important one. You can't have organizations out in the community telling people to move equity because the first thing I'm going to ask you is, how's your organization doing? What have you learned? Where are you on your equity journey? And you lose all credibility if you ain't had no equity journey and you're out asking people to join you for an equity journey. Let me start, say this. This is tough work. It's the most difficult work that any of us will probably ever do, but it's also some of the most important. And I know your interest is in computer science. Our societal interest is in getting equity right because when we don't get equity right, it exposes us to, all, to loss of income and gross domestic product. It makes us vulnerable to foreign interests the wedge that they saw in America the last four or five years was around race and equity issues. So um, I'm not trying to convince people anymore to do this. My posture now is I got some tools that I will think, I think will help you do the work if you are disposed to do it. And there's a lot of different levels that you can do the work. So I'm gonna stop at this point and uh, turn it back over to Brian. Well, thank you, sir. That's powerful work. Um, I'm looking at these tools and trying to figure out how we can incorporate this in our next CS for Georgia um, strategic planning meeting. Um, <clears throat> I just want to remind everybody that the the presentation and all of these links are available in your uh, summit guide, your summit uh, document, which is, I believe, stored at the top of your, um, your chat. I want to thank Junius tremendously for this uh, eye-opening uh, uh, um, I don't know if it's a discussion, but this this presentation, um, you've touched on a lot of points. I don't know if you were able to, to see the chat while you were talking, but um, there's a lot of excitement about a lot of things that you were saying. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate it tremendously. Um, I wanted to remind attendees that we have a couple of tools that we recommend for um, closed captioning. There's a website that you can you can. Uh, utilize and I think Lynn is going to put those up in the chat to help with closed captioning and then there's also a screen reader you can download. Um, uh, now we're going to transition into our separate tracks. Um, uh, again, you'll see on if you click on this sessions tab, you'll see uh, uh, a tab for the counseling uh, track, a tab for the IT support um, and IT teachers, a tab for the computer science teachers, and a tab for the, the leadership's uh, track. So um, we'll take a couple of minutes, get you uh, situated, and we'll see you in those tracks. Junius, again, thank you so much. That was that was very, very helpful to, to set the stage. All right, see you all again. Um, I'll pop in in a couple of different sessions. Junius, feel free to, to hang out today and check out some of the sessions. I think a lot of the people are going to be using some of the things that you mentioned um, and going forward. So. Peace.